This is a big week that we have coming up. Tomorrow, as we do every year, we're going to be honoring the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who has become an icon for this country's attempt to deal with and reckon with its original sin of slavery. On Wednesday, we do as we do every four years, we're going to have an inauguration, but this time we're going to be inaugurating a new president and a new vice president who many in our country challenge the legitimacy of. And then this is all happening during a once in a century pandemic whose devastation escalates as a cure has arrived. So in this very unique moment in American history, I can think of no one who I would rather be talking to than my friend, Anna Devere Smith, the award-winning theater artist. You may know her from her numerous film appearances and from such TV shows as Nurse Jackie and The West Wing and For the People. But how she first came onto my radar was as this extraordinary actress and writer of one-woman shows. What she does is she will pick a theme, and it could be race, it could be education, it could be justice, it could be health care. And then she will go out into the country and interview hundreds of people. Then she will take all those interviews and she will distill them down and she will lovingly stitch a quilt of characters so that, and then the final incarnation is she will present faultlessly, perfectly, all of these different individuals. So her solo shows are epics. She's like a Ken Burns hologram. It's, it's like her shows are a national portrait gallery and she is the curator of our collective consciousness. Anna, my friend, uh, welcome back to First Church. How are you? It's good to see you. I'm, I'm fine and I'm, I'm so happy to be with you at, at, at First Church. And I always feel so good when I'm there. I'm just sorry I can't hear the choir. Well, yeah, and, and, we, and coming back in here, this is the first time I've been here in about a year. And I long for the time when there will be full services back here again. And um, so let's, let's first address just the pandemic because in a normal year, which 2020 was not, you would be in classrooms teaching students, you'd be out in the field interviewing people, and then you would be on stage delighting audiences all around the country and the world. And most of those activities have not been able to be practiced for a year. How have you, because I, we talk every so often, how do you keep your spirits up? Well, um, you know, I, I keep my spirits up by talking to friends like you who have always inspired me. Uh, people like you have a great generosity of spirit. Um, and in fact, uh, I have to say a sort of upside of the pandemic is I've gone back in a conversation with folks I haven't talked to in a long time. One being one of my friends from college. Um, and uh, sort of weekly, I spoke with her. I have a friend who I spoke with every Saturday morning at 7 a.m. Uh, and, um, you know, sort of uh, those unexpected ways of being, talking at length, not in person, which is odd. We don't talk to folks on the phone anymore. Um, you know, uh, families, yes, but friends, not necessarily. So I would say these kind of ritualistic calls that I had, Zoom calls, were important. Um, I was able to work on a couple of projects that mean a lot to me. Uh, in that way, I was thankful in a way to have been on lockdown because there were no distractions in terms of those projects. And I was able to teach on Zoom um, last semester at NYU. And I would say it was actually one of my favorite teaching experiences ever, which I didn't expect it to be. So I would say that we've all, we are much more adaptable than we can imagine we are as human beings. Uh, that's a good thing and maybe sometimes not such a good thing. But I think my adaptability, like the adaptability of others, has come forward. And that notion of um, this time out, this collective time out that the culture and the world have had to go through, I really embraced that at the beginning of this lockdown. 
now I'm feeling more like Tim Robbins in Shawshank, where I feel like I've been in the prison for 19 years and it's time to get out. Uh, let, me, let me ask you about um, the inauguration on Wednesday and the Time Magazine's Persons of the Year, President-elect Joe Biden, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, and they asked you to do the profile on Harris. You did a great job, everything you do is great. Um, but I wanna know from you what you find most remarkable in her. Well, she's remarkable in many ways. I mean, one of the charges I was given when I was approached uh, by Time was, uh, they said, well, you know, a lot has been written about her being the first. So that was already a given to sort of think of another way of, of looking at her and her life. And so I, I, talked to, I talked to a lot of people who had interviewed her. Uh, I admire interviewers, admire you. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, I, you know, I watched her and, in a lot of being interviewed and, you know, and then I looked at a lot of YouTubes that came about when her family in India responded to this momentous moment. Uh, and, and, and what I discovered from talking to her, which has always been out there, it's always been there, but what I tried to crystallize is that she's a very, very special person. It's not just that she's the first. Um, and to keep saying that in a way, uh, we leave those in her audience who look to her as inspiration, but there's what, what they need to also look at is how prepared she is for this, right? And what that preparation was. For one thing, um, she comes from India, very educated people. On the one hand, she comes from a part of India where she's considered the darker one or like a, almost like a black person in America. And there's a lot of racism in India. On the other hand, she's a Brahmin, which is a very, a very high caste in India. Um, her grandfather, who we've heard about, was a very progressive man who believed not only in educating women, which is why her mother could leave and come to the United States. It was unheard of, really. But he let her go to get a bigger education. Her mother also, then her mother marries a black man. Um, and, you know, uh, this I learned from another person from Tamil Nadu, which is the area that Kamala Harris comes from, that this too was, was remarkable. Her father, who we don't hear as much about, um, went to the University of West Indies, uh, was taught mathematics by guess who? Uh, Malcolm Gladwell's father, <laughs> who was an Englishman, comes to the United States. You know, we hear about her father as a progressive person in the civil rights movement, uh, is hired by Stanford to be, um, he gets tenure at Stanford in the 1970s in economics. I was on the tenure track at Stanford in the 90s, thank God I made it, but it's no joke. So for me, it's like in the 70s, and by the way, in the 90s, there were very few black people, still very few black tenured professors at Stanford. I mean, tiny group of people who would meet every once in a while to encourage one another. So, and then she goes and lives in Canada. And then she goes to Howard University, where to me, very significantly, uh, she becomes a part of the AKA sorority. I believe uh, the oldest Greek black society in America, whether women or, you know, as even though it was a sorority. And these folks have been involved um, in, in, uh, uh, in making lives better. Back around 1901, the very beginning of the 20th century, they were very involved with the um, anti-lynching movement. So she's a person who's so many things that have come together in a kind of excellence and discipline that add up. Why shouldn't she be Vice President of the United States of America. It's a mark of our racism that we think it's astonishing. Well, it is astonishing because racism has been astonishing, but it's important for me that people see her as more than a black and a woman, but all of these aspects. And then if you're looking for inspiration, there's a lot of places in that circle of accomplishment that you could touch and go, let me go for that. I now want to uh, focus on Martin Luther King, because tomorrow uh, we honor him as we do every year. And I feel like for many Americans, it's like he only had one speech. 
And for a lot of them, he only had one sentence and it was, I have a dream. And I have felt over a period of time that the, that the power of that speech, uh, because it's been used so much, can, can lose power over time. It becomes an accepted thing in the American culture. But also that there's an aspirational quality about it where it doesn't demand people to do something right now. I can say, great, I'm glad you have a dream. But I've been fortunate enough to see you twice perform the letter from a Birmingham jail. And to me, that has risen in, in my estimation for the piece of writing that, that most resonates with me now and that I think more Americans should know about. Can you tell us what that means to you? Oh, yeah. Well, first, let me just mention, I don't know if I've ever shared this story with you, Scott. Uh, Harry Belafonte uh, published a very thin volume, very nice book uh, called 1963. And in it, he talks about that speech. And uh, the way he describes it is here, here they were in front of throngs and throngs of people. And apparently Martin Luther King, when he spoke, great ardor, but nonetheless had a tendency to drift. And Mahalia Jackson was sitting right behind where he was speaking, right behind the lectern. And he started to drift in his speech. And Mahalia Jackson leaned forward and said, tell him about the dream, Martin. Wow. So it's one of those well-honed riffs that he had. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. you had them as a comic, right? And, you know, and I, I've, I've spent a lot of time going around earlier in my life listening to great speakers. And they always had a great riff, like a jazz musician, that they could pull out at a certain point. So this was a very well-honed riff, and he was wandering. And if Harry Belafonte's account is correct, we wouldn't have the speech the way we do in our national memory if Melia Jackson hadn't leaned forward and said, she was saving him, you know, tell him about the dream, Martin, because she knew he could go down that riff very clearly. What I learned from studying a Letter from Birmingham Jail, performing it, uh, to some extent embodying it, as you know, or, or I don't know if the folks listening know, um, that speech was it was not recorded, it was written, it's, it's literature. He did do a, like a sort of a perfunctory recording, but without any um, expressive dimensions, and his expressive dimensions are quite vast uh, for just, you know, arc, as an archival matter. Um, but it is written, and so um, I had an opportunity to bring alive the writing. And it was written in the condition, as we know, of being trapped in this jail and being very disenchanted um, and having a lot to say. I spoke with his lawyer who came in, you could get in without getting searched in those days. And he came in with yellow pads hidden in his uh, jacket and like uh, restaurant dupe checks and stuff because he was in such a fever writing this and then it was published first by the Atlantic magazine this is this is also why we have it but in it is an extraordinary amount of love uh, there is uh, certainly an indictment of the south and of the church it's there's an indictment but what we don't necessarily automatically fully grasp about Martin Luther King was love. And it's because we've had to turn him into a warrior hero. Uh, but the war was partially a war of love and of hope. And also, you know, he quotes at great length, so many philosophers. He obviously had a photographic memory. Um, he was a genius. And so he was a walking encyclopedia of all of these different figures in theology and philosophy who had informed his ideas. And you just go right through it. I mean, the, the speech could be a course in so many ways. And one way would be just be like, well, who was St. Augustine? You know, <laughs> Do you know about St. Augustine? Um, you know, uh, uh, he evokes Thomas Jefferson. How do we feel about him evoking Thomas Jefferson now that we know so much about Thomas Jefferson? and his slaves. Um, he talks about Martin Buber uh, and this great notion of I thou, do we know what that means? I mean, there's so much for us to learn and study 
in that speech. And I did a lot of research and each time came away so full and so full of uh, just a rich intellectual engagement with the speech, but also a deep feeling for his love and therefore a true sadness. I mean, he's not ashamed to cry about it, really. And I think a lot of warrior folks uh, wouldn't be caught dead crying, but he, he would, he, he would, I imagine he was weeping in some moments when he was writing it. And the sadness that you talk about that comes out in that letter, some of it is directed towards people who many readers of the letter can identify as being. In other words, the well-intentioned, the, the liberal, the white liberals, and he even points a finger at the black ministers who are saying that he is in Birmingham and, that, and they call him an outside agitator and they call him a radical. And you've got a, there's a section that you do where you talk about his getting comfortable with that notion of, of, of being called a radical. Yes, well, it's really white ministers who he's out there, where he points his finger at black people, is pointing out that we have these extremes of people, uh, some who've just given up, you know, because what's the point? Nobody's, nobody's there for them, you know? Uh, and on the other hand, the black middle class, you know, people who he knew in school probably, or lawyers and doctors and people like that, who, you know, had a sense of their own accomplishment, didn't want to do any more. And then he really, you know, uh, uh, it rings a cautionary bell about the radicals or, you know, who want to burn it all down, who, who were becoming more and more popular at that time. He comes up, you know, he also has, as we know, a way with words that will never be forgotten. And he talks about being accused of being an extremist. And at first he felt pretty lousy about that, that these white ministers called the Christians is the, the key point is He's really using in a very deft and expert way the expectation of Christians, right? So these are white Christian ministers. And, you know, he says, well, you called me an extremist. It fell side first. I, I was rather surprised and disappointed that you would think that. And then he goes down the list. Well, you know, uh, wasn't John Bunyan an extremist? Wasn't uh, Paul an extremist? You know, was, was, wasn't Jesus? He lists all the extremists this is where Thomas Jefferson comes in. And then he says, well, so now that I think about it, I mean, I'm kind of proud of being called an extremist. The question is not whether or not we should be extremists, but what kind of extremists shall we be? Shall we be extremists for hate or shall we be extremists for love? And I, I think that's this extraordinary turning point in the in the letter another person who was called an extremist in his time who you portray in notes from the field which i had the pleasure of seeing twice uh is the late king colleague and uh u.s representative from georgia john lewis and i wonder if you could tell people just for a little bit about the core of his story to you and then as you began to perform it, what kind of reaction did, did you get to the words in his monologue? And by the way, I think I would get a very different reaction now. Um, well, uh, I had heard that a, 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 a police officer, um, when um, John uh, uh, Lewis made his pilgrimage to Selma, uh, which he did yearly for many, many years. And then congressmen accompanied him um, uh, to uh, um, Montgomery and, and, and Selma and Birmingham um, for about 13 years, I think. And on this one particular occasion, he uh, was uh, in Montgomery and a police chief, the police chief came to this um, gathering in a church and he he came in place of the mayor who couldn't come and i suppose ceremonially the mayor would come and welcome the the, the the delegates really from washington and and this police officer said you know um i just want to say that uh the way we behaved um in the early days uh was not right you know, uh, we allowed a mob to beat you. Um, we did this, we did that. And so 
I've come to say, I want to apologize. This is not the police, uh, this is not the department I want to be the chief of, and we're doing this, that, and the other to correct it. And to show you just how much, how deep my apology is, um, I want to take off my badge and give it to you. And uh, so in the, in the speech, John Lewis says, so I stood up to accept the badge and I started crying. He said, everybody in the church started crying, wasn't a dry eye in the church. And there's a pause and he says, and I said, officer, chief, I cannot accept your badge. <laughs> I've been in a couple of audiences when I say that. <laughs> I've been Harvard in this audience with a lot of black professors that clap. Like, yeah, like, well, you're right, I'm not taking your badge. And so that, and then he says, I am not worthy to accept your badge. Don't you need it? And the, the, the police officer says, Congressman, I can get another one. <laughs> I want you to have your badge. <laughs> so, and then, you know, John Lewis says, and I, and, and I took it and, and I'm going to hold on to it forever. I'm never ever going to forget it. And, uh, and then he goes on to talk about what it meant to him. This was the first time ever that any police chief in any city where he visited or was beaten in the 60s ever, ever had apologized. And what that meant and how liberated he felt uh, in that moment. And it, and, and, it, and, it, and it said to him, you know, you know, never lose faith, keep the faith, you know, basically just keep on going because you never know. And then there's a second apology that he accounts for where a Klansman came to his office with his son in 2009 and said, you know, I beat you in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and I, I want to apologize. Will you, will you forgive me? And, you know, Lewis says that, says, I accept your apology, I forgive you. One of the great gifts that religion can provide are rituals, a, a process such as this for forgiveness, because all of us need to be forgiven. All of us have done things. And when I hear stories like Pope John Paul forgiving the uh, would-be assassin, a man who actually fired a gun at him, he didn't kill him because his aim was not infallible, um, but uh, he forgave him. Or more, more recently, the families um, of, of, the, of the people killed in the church in Charleston, South Carolina, they forgave the white supremacist murderer. And, and when I see the very powerful videotape of, of that exchange and see these people saying, I forgive you, I think to myself uh, two things. One, none of us can know how we would be in that situation until unfortunately we are there. Two, I have the suspicion that I am not that good. Three, I think that if I were that good, every day of my life would be an incremental Christmas. But I'm not sure that I'm, but as I say, I'm, I don't know that I'm that good. And, and one thing I think about each year when we, when we honor King is Jesus provided a process for forgiveness of individual sins. It's a trickier thing to talk about forgiveness of collective sins. So you think of South Africa or you think of America or any country that had institutional slavery and de facto slavery long after. We had it with Jim Crow. We continue to have it today. And how do we get past to, to the next step where we are all living as equals as much as we possibly can be. Um, and, and so I, I think about how does any black American forgive the founding fathers, not just Jefferson, but Washington, Madison. I mean, I, I think four, four or five out of the first uh, presidents we're, we're all slaveholders. That's where we start. 
and we can't go back in the time machine, go back to the Continental Congress, get rid of the slave owners, and make a new constitution or a new declaration based upon the ones who didn't own slaves. So that's where we start. How then do we move forward? And I think the first step is, um, is, is of anything, is admitting a problem. Whenever I do uh, talkbacks in theaters, I usually ask people two questions. I always ask people two questions, and I want to ask you, um, what faith, if any, was there in your household when you were growing up? And then, what faith, if any, do you have now? Yeah, well, I grew up, um, actually, my parents, in those days, churches in Baltimore and the black community were almost tribes in and of themselves. And uh, my mother had grown up in a church called Grace Memorial Baptist Church. My father had grown up in a church called Union Memorial Baptist Church. And rather than you know, them deciding, well, our children are going to go to this church or the other church. They decided to leave it up to me. I was the oldest child. And I have this kind of memory, and I don't have that many memories of myself as very little. Uh, so I must have been, I was very little in a red raincoat. I remember that, being in a little red raincoat of my father, taking me, uh, dropping me off to Sunday school at uh, Union Memorial <laughs> Methodist Church, which was about a mile and a half from where we lived. And that became our church. So I kind of claim the church that would become the church for the children. And then my, my father was not a church goer, goer ultimately. Uh, he probably stopped the minute he got out of his father's house. And then my mother joined that church, Union Memorial Methodist Church, became a very active member and was buried there. I mean, they're the ones, those women, because most of the men had died by the time my mother died. Women, I guess, at that point in the black community outlived their husbands. And so, you know, this is where my mother was celebrated and put to rest, um, Union Memorial Methodist Church. I uh, became an Episcopalian while I was in, Cath in um, I was at Catholic school in acting conservatory in San Francisco. I joined Grace Cathedral. Uh, I went and took all of the catechism classes that were required and joined. And then I had an experience that made me turn my back on the church. Uh, but then um, in 2011, when I was back in San Francisco uh, performing, I started going to that church again and uh, to morning prayer every morning. And I made extraordinarily good friends there. Uh, one of the priests and the dean became my very good friend. And I went there and did a, um, I went there and was their first artist in residence. And it's there that I performed John Lewis uh, for the first time and wrote a play on the subject of grace uh, with a beautiful concert cellist Joshua Roman, I'm a seeker. And the priest who I met at Grace Cathedral um, said to me, I, I want to, he said that he recommended to me that my relationship to the church should be that I'm peeking in the door. So he, that peeking, but I'm a seeker. Whatever I'm doing, uh, there is, my faith is a faith of seeking and seeking with belief and seeking, trying as hard to seek with humility as I possibly can. And I get very nervous about people who are claimed non-believers. I'd like to know you believe in something other than money. Uh, you know, even if it's chocolate cake, I, I like to know that you believe in something. And so that's me, I'm, I'm seeking, I'm very attracted to people who have uh, taken on religion and theology as a, a serious part of their lives and sometimes think that I should go uh, to seminary and, and study further. I want to end on one last thing. When I asked you a couple of weeks ago, when you graciously had agreed to do this, I said, you know, this can be part of a, of a service. And is there a hymn that, uh, that interests you or that resonates for you? And you said, on Christ, the solid rock, I stand all other ground is sinking sand, which was written in 1834 by a Baptist preacher named Edward Moat. Can you tell us why it's going to be sung now? And can you tell us why those words resonate for you? Well, it's not the words why it was my favorite hymn. I haven't heard it in years and years. It's the way 
they sang it at uh, Union Memorial Methodist Church. And Union, uh, Union Memorial Methodist Church was a fairly, it was a little bit on the staid side compared to other churches, certainly Baptist churches, or I had a chance, we had a, a babysitter who uh, was a holy roller. And of course, I just couldn't wait to, I did everything in the world to get permission to go to her church for my father, sat outside in the car the entire time I was there. The service went on for five hours, but <laughs> they were dancing and, you know, stuff. Uh, but Union Memorial Methodist Church was, was pretty staid in that way. But there were certain hymns that, and, 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 you know, I don't know if it had a great choir. It wasn't a choir that you would travel to see. And there are choirs like that, that you'll travel. I mean, here in New York, you know, the travel choirs, there are choirs in that people come to see your church to hear that choir, right? I mean, right. Um, so uh, it was the way they sang that song that they sounded, they were moaning when they sang it for some reason. And it could be that one person in the choir was really that it spoke to them, but it sounded more like an anthem. And they moaned, I would say. And I feel that a lot of the beauty of black culture is that it has revised moaning into something that opens your heart the way only a moan or a howl can do. But in it is placed hope and love and possibility. And I think that song was the one they moaned that I felt they really moaned more than others. I hope that you will enjoy this rendition, I love which anything is anything that your choir sings in any rendition. It's a beautiful choir and the acoustics of uh, First Church are just made for singing and moaning and howling. <laughs> yeah, I, f I feel like the natural echo here makes me makes everything I say sound more important and profound. Um, Anna, I cannot thank you enough. It is such a joy to talk to you, and I get to ask you things that I wouldn't be asking you if we're just having a normal conversation. We'd be talking about whatever's coming up in the news that day or what's in our lives at that moment. But, but this is, I, I am so thankful to know you, and, and we in America have, are, are so, and because of, you know, all the awards that you've received are an indication of how much you are treasured. And I wish that we all can go back to a world resembling the one we all used to take for granted so that you may once again be on stage and I may be on the audience. Anna DeVere Smith, thank you very much.